Hi, welcome back or welcome to Dialogues with me, Richard Reeves. My conversation today is with a philosopher, Claire Chambers. She's a professor of political philosophy at the University of Cambridge, where she's also a fellow uh, at Jesus College. I've been reading uh, her work for some time now, including on issues around marriage and the family, feminism and so on. But I was really struck with her new and forthcoming book, uh, which is called Intact a defense of the unmodified body. And we spend most of our time uh, talking about that. And in the book and in the conversation, what Claire does is to, to defend this idea of a body that has not been modified, both as a, a political idea and as an ethical one. And she doesn't argue that, that our bodies don't change. Of course, our bodies change as a result of what we do or don't do or eat, don't eat, drink, don't drink all the time. But she does talk about the, the reasons why we would seek to modify our body and she gives three our appearance our health and hygiene and our identity we use my brushing of my teeth that, that morning as as an example uh, of of the reasons we might a trivial example of why we might modify uh, our body there are of course much more serious uh, examples including um, people transitioning from from one sex to another uh, all the way through uh, how what we do with our hair down to uh, earrings and so on um, and we don't get into all of that although she does cover much, much of that in the book. One of the things that struck me is her discomfort with the idea of being trapped in the wrong body, which is, of course, quite an important uh, rallying cry for some of those in, in, the, in the trans movement, although, uh, although not all by any means, and why that idea has some real problems, uh, as well as some potential. And, and the problems are because, to some extent, we're all not in the right body or our own true body. There's a real often a misalignment. That's why, as she points out, new mothers are urged to get their body back um, we also talk about how far gender differences are the result of nature or culture, how the distinction between cosmetic surgery and cultural surgery is not as clear as you might think, why shaming doesn't really work as a public health measure. And we talk quite a lot about issues around obesity, for example, the way that bodybuilding has changed over time and not, not in her view, for the better. And we also, towards the end, discuss the really striking differences in rates of male circumcision, uh, which is a, a, a non-trivial a modification of the body uh, across different countries and why it's 80 percent or so in the us although drop it falling uh, and much lower six percent or less in in the uk and and in the uk it's described as a procedure of last resort in the national health service and what that example tells us about the role of culture and especially culture in defining what counts as a as a medical procedure so all in all i found uh, i found a book a really even-handed and thoughtful and in-depth treatment of some some very important and increasingly i would say topical and controversial uh, issues that, that we're facing um from a, a really applied philosopher so it was great to read her work and a real pleasure to have her on i, I hope you enjoy the conversation too so claire chambers welcome to dialogues thanks for coming on it's a pleasure and congratulations on your new book. I've, I've, I've read a good deal of your work, actually, including some of your work on feminism and, and marriage. Um, but this uh, latest book, which looks at the issue of uh, the importance of bodies uh, and of the unmodified body, the politics and uh, ethics of the unmodified body. And actually, it's a book that in a different time uh, might be of interest to scholars, um, but it is very topical right now. I mean, our news feeds are full of discussions about issues around trans rights, etc., or auto bodily autonomy, who gets to decide what gender is, what sex is, where the lines are. So it's kind of highly topical uh, subject. So given that it's likely to be, in that sense, very helpful, but also quite controversial, what's what's the motivation for moving into this space? My very first book, which I published back in 2008, um, was called Sex, Culture and Justice, The Limits of Choice. And in that book, I thought about um, the reasons that people might have to choose things that harm them, to choose practices that disadvantage them, in particular, and um, thinking about women making those choices. And I situated that within a tradition of feminists understanding the social context of people's choices and why that shapes what we want to do. And then, as you said in your introduction, I moved away from that topic somewhat with my second book, which was about marriage. Um, but that interest in people's choices and why people choose as they do had never left me. And it was actually while doing some work with the Nuffield Council on bioethics here in the UK on the ethics of cosmetic procedures that I returned to that earlier interest. Um, and as part of that work with the Nuffield Council, one of the things that I learned um, that was incredibly surprising to me actually was that the cosmetic surgery industry is incredibly um, under-regulated 
and that most people don't know about that. And that that under-regulation extends not just to, you know, clear cases of surgery, but also to various invasive practices like Botox, fillers, and so on, which most of us would kind of assume were being regulated in a very clear way, but in fact, um, um, often, often are not. And so that was my way back into thinking about the body, why we modify the body, what um, encourages us to do that, why we modify our bodies even in situations where doing so might be risky or, or painful or expensive. Um, and it was um, through that, then, that interest in beauty and cosmetic um, modification that I extended the work into the wide variety of topics that the book discusses, which includes not only beauty but also things like fitness um, and you know, bodybuilding, weight loss, um, disability, um, how we... Um, how we interact with our children, the kinds of body modifications we make on children and, and many others. Yes, uh, and it's, it is very comprehensive. And I will say that particularly around some of the issues we'll get to around uh, the trans movement in particular, I think it's a very even-handed and thorough investigation of those issues. I think the best I've read, and I've read a, f- a few in this in this space. But let's let's kind of start with where I think you start, which are the various motivations for body modification. Uh, that people might have um, because I think that it's important to understand that there are different reasons why one might want to do it and and you speculate about a, a few in in particular um, and then we'll get into the question of like why is why is our body never good enough which I I thought was very powerful but you know I was I was brushing my teeth this morning and I thought more about that than I probably ever have before because of having kind of read your book and thinking about the motivations for it so am i doing this for one of the reasons you give is hygiene kind of health and hygiene and and maintenance part of it is aesthetic though too you know i don't want my teeth to fall out partly because it will be ugly and i don't want and i don't want to smell bad um for my partner etc so it's partly that uh, too so it's about maintenance but maybe i also thought maybe it's because i'm culturally trapped by this sense of how my teeth should look right they should be white and there's a normative view of it and so and I was, as I was brushing my teeth I was trying to figure out which of those it was and unfortunately of course the answer was all of them but is that is that a close to a sort of summary of some of the different reasons we might choose to modify our body even from that very simple example that, that's a, that's a really great example so when I first started to think about these issues I wanted to think about what it might be for a body to be unmodified right and it, you soon realize that it's completely impossible to have an unmodified body if you mean by that something very literal yeah you know, a body that is never consciously changed because we all change our bodies all the time um you talk about brushing your teeth but of course we eat we drink we we exercise we don't exercise all these things that we routinely do have an effect on what our bodies are like and so the question then is well what kinds of different uh, you know can we separate kinds of modification based on their intention um, and the three that i talk about in the book are firstly appearance um, secondly health and hygiene something in in that sphere and thirdly identity and I think that your example of toothbrushing so wonderfully shows why those three categories are not discrete they're not separable because they're very often connected so in the book I spend quite a bit of time showing how some practices that we might think of as being about health are often also about identity Um, and a a good example there would be the practice of, of male circumcision um, where it's a practice that is in some mm. cultures understood as a, a practice about health and in other cultures not. And so the, kind of where the, quest, the question of whether a practice is about health is in itself an identity-focused, cultural-based um, based question. Um, similarly with health and appearance, as you say, brushing your teeth both maintains their health, that's your, your hope, but also you hope keeps, keeps them looking good and often we think of healthy bodies as being attractive bodies Um, often we think of bodies without disability which is not the same thing as saying healthy bodies but we think of bodies without disability as being attractive bodies as well so we have these complicated intersections between those three sort of broad motivations of, of health appearance and identity and part of the purpose of the book is to try to analyze some of that complexity Yes, uh, and we'll get into some some more serious examples of it. In fact, I hope we will talk a bit about male circumcision, which you talk about at some length, which is, which is an, uh, I think, a very interesting example of how there is, as you say, not really a clear divide between cultural surgery and cosmetic surgery. Like what counts as cosmetic is defined you know, culturally as well, uh, and male circumcision is an example of that too. Um, one of the things that I think, obviously, there's a very long, uh, a long discussion about the role of kind of women's bodies in particular. And it seems to me that 
part of your argument here is almost like it's an argument within feminism between mm-hmm. uh, a strand of feminism which insists on the embodied experience of women uh, uh, and one which attempts to sort of, in a sense, to escape from biology. There's one which uh, mm-hmm. honors biology uh, and and our, our inescapably embodied nature and one that uh, tries to escape from biology altogether. And you end up pretty strongly, it seems to me, after being very fair to both sides, on the sense that like we are in our bodies, we can't escape our embodied existence and the differences that we might have between them. And so in the end, the attempt to disband nature altogether is doomed to failure and may actually end- undermine the women's cause because it doesn't honour the embodied experience. Is that a fair summary? Um- to, to some degree, I think what I would say is that both of those strands have to be and remain part of feminism. It's not that there's one or the other and we choose between them. It's that they've both been an essential part of feminist theory and activism. So the reason that feminists have to critique nature and reject nature is because the idea that um, nature explains and justifies women's inequality has been an, you know, a key part of patriarchy for centuries. So feminists have had to routinely and repeatedly sever that connection and although the ways in which that idea that nature justifies and explains women's inequality the kind of precise version of that idea has changed the the broad shape of that idea is still very prevalent today we see it now in ideas that understand um, gender difference and gender inequality as being connected to something like neuropsychological differences or evolutionary differences or whatever so you still see that um, uh, that narrative coming in today. So feminists continue to have to um, reject very strongly the idea that women's difference, women's biological difference, naturally explains and justifies their social inequality. So that's never going to go away as a requirement of feminism. But also feminists do have to, um, and have always wanted to, recognise and insist on the significance of embodiment, um, both to the reality of women's inequality. So feminist analysis of inequality is always going to play some reference to the fact of women's bodies playing a role in the way that societies um, uh, subordinate women, whether it's through the subordination of, uh, of pregnancy and maternity, whether it's through sexual violence, whether it's through beauty norms. You know, the body plays a role in social structures that subordinate women. But also the experience of various kinds of embodiment has also played a part in a great deal of feminist analysis of what it is to live as a woman under conditions of inequality and how we can therefore think about both understanding existing inequality and thinking about a feminism that sort of centres and responds to that women's embodiment without sort of suppressing it or denigrating it. So I think both of those parts of feminism are really important. And I think that the Tension between them is partly what is behind the current um, controversy about trans rights and trans identity, because both of those strands of feminism feed into what has become, I think, very unfortunately, the idea of two sides of a debate. And which side of feminism needs to be emphasised, I think, is a political question. At certain times and places, um, nature you know, takes on too strong a role. And so the right thing for feminists to emphasise is the destruction of nature. In other times and places, embodiment is lost. And what feminists need to do is bring back the side of their tradition that emphasises the significance of embodiment. So I think uh, at one point in, in, in Intact, I say that in my first book, I felt that the tide was very strongly in favour of natural explanations of women's inferiority. Mm. There was a kind of resurgence of evolutionary biology and various biological theories of women's difference from men and women's inequality from men. And so at that point, I felt it was important to emphasise the critiques of nature. Um, But I think that we're currently in a position where perhaps the the tables have turned and I expect they'll turn again, you know, over the coming years and decades. (laughs) And we'll have to keep emphasising both sides of this really difficult balance um, that is in feminist theory and and activism. Yeah, I think it's um, there's a really interesting historical question as well as a political one, and I, I I would hope that the the fear that nature will be used as the grounds for discrimination should diminish over time as we progress more closely to equality, and that therefore this is one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Therefore, we can 
become a bit more relaxed about allowing natural differences to be expressed or explained without the same fear that they will be then weaponized as a way to to make one sex better than the other. And I think you actually quote Dworkin saying, look, it's just as bad an idea to say that women are naturally superior. Any idea of natural superiority is, is wrong. And there was there has been a bit of a trend of that sometimes in the you know the women are wonderful movement and so on. It's like women the future is female, women are better, they're more peaceful, they're more cooperative, etc. And I but I'm I'm interested like in a country in countries where we really have made a huge amount of progress towards gender equality, there is this thing called the STEM paradox. I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's like in the more gender equal the country is on most measures actually you see sort of more differences emerging in the occupational choices that men and women make. And one one theory that's put forward to explain that, which I find reasonably convincing, is that at a certain point of equality, of reaching equality, I'm not saying you get full equality, but that natural differences can start to express themselves without the fear that you're going to be constrained by them. You can express them without being constrained by them. So isn't the same in other words we can relax a little bit we can accept that natural differences are real but the distributions overlap and that we're not going to be kind of confined by them and one would hope that that should be getting more prevalent but i'm not sure that's true i'm not sure that we are getting more comfortable talking about natural differences on average distributions overlap all the caveats that you go that you do much better than i am here do you agree with that as a as a kind of hopeful sign thought well i think john stuart mill had a lot right in his book Subjection of Women, right, where he talks about this question of the distinction between sex and gender, although that's not his his terminology, but right, the question no, of whether his language. sex yeah. yeah, right, sex differences are, are natural yeah. or or cultural. And one of the things that Mill says is, you know, how could we possibly know? And of course, Mill's writing in a time when you know the the measures of scientific the, the, the sophistication of scientific measures of of um, biological difference were much less um, sophisticated than they are now, but. Mill's basic point is when you have people brought up in strongly gendered societies, you just don't have a control. You don't have a comparison between women and men, females and males brought up with gender norms and brought up without gender norms. So it's incredibly difficult to know what are the natural differences and what aren't the natural differences. And so I think there's a kind of necessary caution here when we say oh well but we've become much more equal and so any existing gender inequality must be the result of natural difference um you know we've got to be cautious there Mm. because the question is always well if we don't have a gender equal society and we clearly don't we're very very far from that we have very strong um, ideas of um, gender norms and the ways in which men and women are and should be different and these are kind of inculcated in us pretty much from birth they're very it's very clearly gendered context we all grow up in um, so as long as we have that situation, I think it's very difficult for us to be able to say that any um, examples of different behaviour are clearly natural. So what we have to be striving for, I think, if we're thinking about you know, progressive change and equality, is we have to be striving for thinking about how we can make the social conditions as equal as possible, how we can make, um, how we can make the social possibilities for people of all genders as equal as possible, and how we can you mm-hmm. know, continue to stamp out the forms of discrimination and oppression that we know still exist rather than kind of concerning ourselves too much with whether women are you know naturally more inclined to care about housework than men or something like that right that that seems to me to be just looking at the wrong part of the of the dilemma yeah i agree i think the question is like how, how and when might we know so i think we have to be incredibly cautious especially given our history uh, and given how recent the change is in terms of on some measures of gender gender equality but but you do you I think it's important at least to allow for the possibility that there will be different patterns of of choices. I know, let's take let's take an example that's hopefully not quite so controversial. Maybe we won't end up in a world where 50% of our fighter pilots are women. And that won't only be the result of socialization of men to be more aggressive and women to be less aggressive right that that you know let's say we end up with a situation where only 20 percent of our fighter pilots are women um i think one could reasonably conclude under conditions of general you know, greater equality that that represents a, a genuine difference on average right so you've got 20 you know, the distributions overlap <laughs> which is why it's why it's not zero <laughs> but it's also why it's not 50 um uh and the question then would become, well, how do I know? How, how can I feel confident that we've 
we've downgraded culture enough to feel more confident that kind of nature is really what's playing the role here. You have this lovely line, I think, riffing off Mill, and I agree with what you say about Mill. Mill's my subject. I think you do a beautiful job of describing him, where you say there's been so much gender, there's been no room for sex. I think, mm. you said, I think that's how you put it. Mm. Right? Great mm. line. And, and I think that's the problem here. Is it's like, how will we know when we've sort of sufficiently, and we, we, and we clearly have right, reduced gender over the last 100 years, 50 years, 20 years. How will how how will we start to know that we've kind of to sufficiently reduced it down that we can become a bit more relaxed, or is it just a question of like time and patience and so on? Because my slight fear is that in the debate right now, it's almost as if we've achieved we haven't achieved anything in the last fifty years or hundred years uh, in terms of reducing the power of gender, and that's just not that just seems to me to be empirically not true. Well, let's think about that example of of, of fighter pilots that, that you suggest. That's a mm. nice example. So. The question is, if you have a scenario where we think we've got a you know, pretty gender equal society, but we still have an observable difference in patterns of choices to become fighter pilots, say, the question is, well, what follows from that in this imaginary society, right? Is that difference costless, right? Or does it translate into differences of, of pay, differences of status? Um, you know, so, of course, one of the uh, suspicions, I suppose, is that Pattern differences are rarely costless, particularly pattern differences that associate with um, characteristics which are have been the subject of, you know, centuries of historic discrimination. So we might be sceptical about whether this imagined society could have a, a gender difference that was genuinely costless, unless it was an imagined society that had no history of gender inequality. Um, but even if it did somehow have this costless difference, um, well, then again, we might wonder how long that gender equality would last in a society with patterned gendered choices. Because, of course, if there was a majority of a certain profession which were, which were men, in the example you gave, then that starts to consolidate into a sort of role models for other people for the next generation. The idea that, you know, men are better fighter pilots or being a fighter pilot isn't appropriate for women. So it's not just so much that we have this very clear sense of um, gender inequality causes bad things, stop gender inequality, the bad things will happen, and then any any difference, we don't have to worry about it. It's that there's a kind of interplay between um, difference and and hierarchy, and there's a question of, you know, what it takes to move out of that space. And, of course, this isn't a, a move that we have succeeded in in making and it's absolutely not part of my argument to suggest that we've made no progress it's clearly you know as you say it's clearly um, all kinds of progress has been made in many areas many professions many choices are much less um, in the grip of gendered norms than they were a generation ago Um, but I do think we just need to continue to think about where is the inequality where do the inequalities persist and what are the implications of those inequalities and where does you know, inequality in the sense of a hierarchy still persist? Yes, I, I think that's right. Uh, and that's why you worry a lot about implications for things like pay and so on too. And I also completely agree with you about the role model point. I, I think that what we, sh- we clearly want a society in which there are sufficient numbers uh, of different groups in all the occupations such that it fe- it doesn't feel so gendered that um you can't sort of you can't allow actually a natural preference if you're a woman to want to fly a fighter plane to be expressed right. or vice versa for men to work in early education so in the US I've just been doing some work on this actually proportionately there are twice as many women flying uh US military planes as there are men teaching early education and so if you're worried about role models I think the lack of men in caring roles uh, is a much bigger problem, actually, because you're literally every day (laughs) showing (laughs) children what it means to be in those roles. And they're they're very strongly gendered in in the other direction. I I think from your role model point of view, that's a much bigger problem. So I'm I'm more worried, actually, about the gender, the, the gendered nature of the caring professions than I am the other way around. I'm using I was using fighter pilots as an alternative example, but I'm actually honestly much more worried about pre K classrooms. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that the issue of, of caring work runs both ways, right? So firstly, men don't have adequate role models of other men working in the caring sector, either for money or as, you know, working un- unpaid in the home, right? As, as so doing caring and domestic work, generally speaking, whether paid or unpaid. So there's that sense that for men, caring and domestic work is not uh, a kind of authentic or a, or a real choice that they might want to aspire to. 
But then that also translates as, again into, into women's choices as well because there is, it's part, again, of the devaluing of caring work, right? It's not a mere mm-hmm. difference. It's a devalued um, form of work. It's a form of work which, um, you know, our entire society relies upon and which is very either unpaid or very low paid. And so, again, then you also have a question of, well, for some women... Um, caring work and domestic work is the only option that seems open to them. For other women, it doesn't seem like a realistic option because it seems like a low-paid, low-valued um, option. And that's something, again, I talked about a lot in my first book where I talked about the question of um, the choice to be a housewife or the choice to be um, a, a sort of stay-at-home mother. And the question here is not whether that choice is you know, a good choice or a bad choice, but this, all the structures that surround the choice, right? whether that choice is something which comes with... Um, financial equality or inequality, financial dependence, whether it's a choice that has status, whether it's something that is seen as a genuine option for for all. So no, I fully agree with you on that question of the caring sector as being a really Mm. fundamental issue for women and for men. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's let's move back a little bit to intact. That took us on a bit of a tangent uh, tangent there, just because I'm interested in that bit of your work too. But this idea of the, the, the unmodified body as a political construct, and I would say an ethical construct too, you say at various points that that, that we all we feel there's something wrong with our body right there's no such thing as the right the right body in one way or another that it's always feeling like there's something kind of that there's something wrong and so actually being in that's this sense of being in the wrong body either in the sense that the trans movement would, would talk about it but just all of us feel like mm. there's something wrong with that there's a wrongness about our body where and, and you talk about the role of philosophers in applying uh, in in applying that notion but i would add religion and to uh, and so this sort of sense of like talk a bit about how you think the body itself just in and of itself is valued or devalued um by kind of various because it seems to me that's an important part of your argument the intrinsic experiential value of the body just as a body rather than you know we're not we're not meat on a we're not brains on a stick right the body matters and why is that so important to your argument Good. So I think there's, there's very clear empirical evidence that there is an, what psychologists call an epidemic of appearance anxiety, right? That if the huge majority of us feel that our bodies are wrong in some way or another. And you see this in women, you see it in men, and you see it in children as well. So one very large study in the UK that I cite in the book is that um, 70% of women feel that there is media pressure to have a perfect body. And two thirds of men feel ashamed of their body right so it's a slightly different feeling for both but in both cases it's the majority of women the majority of men feeling some sense of of wrongness but we don't experience that as the human condition you know you might say well if everyone feels it it's not a question of equality it's not a question of justice it's just what, what it's like to be human but I don't think we feel it that way I don't think we feel well I feel bad about my body but everyone does so it doesn't matter I think we experience it as a very private personal individualized sense of shame or inadequacy you know when we feel bad about our bodies we feel that it's because there is some part or some aspect of our body specifically our own individual body which is wrong you know I think if I said to most people what would you most like to change about their body they could really readily give an answer that wouldn't be a a difficult question to answer and so I think what we do is we have a sense that there is something wrong with our body always there's something very specifically wrong with our personal bodies probably more than one thing and we know what it is and we also feel that that wrongness reflects on us as people and you see that message repeated over and over again in, in, in advertising in media in ways that we think about um you know think about the l'oreal slogan because you're worth it because you are worth it you know you are worth Make time on your on your body. We think about ideas like letting yourself go, right, or, or self care. All these ideas which suggest that the body and the self are really closely connected. Um, and one of the examples I talk about in the book is this phrase that I find really fascinating of, of getting your body back, which is a phrase that's often used to describe women who've just had a baby. Yeah. So this phrase, getting your body back, is very familiar. I think we all kind of know what it means. If you Google it, you see hundreds of thousands of articles on how to get your body back but the idea is it's not how to get thinner it's not how to get sexier although this is what you're supposed to be doing it the phrase is how to get your body back like there's a kind of authenticity and realness to the body you're supposed to be getting back so I think we fundamentally connect the body to us 
we are constantly receiving the message that our bodies are not good enough. And that equates as part of this you know, general feeling that, uh, that we are not good enough. And so that, I think, makes it, takes it into the category of, of ethical, as you say, um, and also political, because so many of the standards we have about what bodies should be like um, reflect and reinforce, again, existing structures of, of inequality. So we've talked together about sex and gender. That would be an obvious example. But many of our bodily standards are also um, racialized, often racist, following patterns of existing um, racial domination. So bodies that are seen as um, characteristic of racial minorities are often also seen as um, less aesthetically pleasing, again, by a dominant discourse. Um, you see the reflection of bodily standards as also being a reflection of hierarchies of, of disability status, of age, of class. There's some kind of intersection with um, clear political structures. So that was a, a long answer to your question, but that's why I think that the unmodified body is, is a political concept. It's also an ethical concept, as you say, and why the connection between the body and the self uh, makes a difference. Yes, and I, I like the way you talk about this sense of constant misalignment, and obviously that varies hugely. I, I think my actually, you know, why my wife was saying to me the other day, she's, she says she doesn't know a woman, even in her own circle of pretty, you know relatively healthy women, um, who don't think they're five or ten pounds too heavy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like every every woman feels that, and every you know, man, and there's probably the, the male equivalent, and so on too. That misalignment, I think, is is important, and we'll get onto some of the implications of that too for how we think about what's what quotes counts as a disease. But I wanted to try out one idea on you. This was partly inspired by your discussion of bodybuilding, mm. which is very interesting, and how that's changed over time from a sort of Greek ideal. Or you look at the guys, in fact, you look at the, the earlier bodybuilder uh, or Mr. Universes, and they, they, look, they look great. They don't look weird, whereas now they look weird. Uh, and I wonder if there isn't a role for a, a positive role for an ideal, Right. So I'm, I'm not in any way discounting the negative side of this and we'll get to that. But but part of me is just feeling like, is there something to be said for an ideal for which we strive, even though we know we'll never achieve it? Uh, and so how do you think about that balance between the role of an ideal? And you're quite you're quite positive about the role of that masculine ideal, for example, from the earlier areas of bodybuilding and their feminine equivalents, as opposed to an oppressive social expectation. Like, where's, how, do we, how do we think about that line? Great, thanks. There's so much there. So just in response to your comment about women feeling they're five or ten pounds heavier, I just want to flag up a brilliant song that I quote at the very end of the book by Rachel Lark and the Damaged Goods, which you can mm. see on YouTube, which is called... Um, all the other women should love my bodies, but I want to lose five pounds. And it just encapsulates that entirely. Yes. It's fantastic. I recommend everyone goes and yes, watches it right. straight away. I think, um, I think I read that bit out to my wife, which caused her to say what she said. Yes. Right. Well, watch the video. The, the video is superb. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so on the ideals, good. Yes. So here's a question that I struggled with over the, the time it was taking me to write the book. As, as, as a philosopher, as as you know, academics, intellectuals, people who care about thought and ideas and books, we would tend to have a very clear sense that it is absolutely virtuous to improve yourself um, intellectually, educationally, to improve your mind, right? That the ideal of, improv- of improvement of the self through education, we would see as very clearly virtuous. You know, should I spend my time learning a language that I don't need for work that's just just for the pursuit of its own good? Should I spend my time reading great classics of literature? These seem very, very virtuous from a perspective of a certain kind of um, of, of milieu. Um, and so is it anything more than just a, a cultural difference, also connected perhaps to a class difference, a professional difference, that would make somebody like me, you know, an academic, uh, think that, uh, the goal to change your body is less worthy or less virtuous or less ethical or something than the goal to change your mind. So I spent a long time really trying to struggle with that question and to really try to challenge myself to make sure that I wasn't just simply replicating a kind of academic prejudice that reading a book was more valuable than than spending time painting nails or something like that, right? Why should that be the case? So there's a question of whether or not simply having a goal that you work towards 
a goal of self-improvement of some kind, that might just be a good thing for human beings to do. Certainly not a harmful thing for human beings to do, right? Why not just encourage that? And I think that's right. Um, And I think that a goal for self-improvement through the mind and through the body can be really beneficial for many of us. The question then is, what is the goal? Does, what does it take to meet the goal? And how do you feel if you don't succeed in meeting the goal? That's the question. And I think for many of these um, modification practices that I talk about in Intact, um, the goal is in principle unattainable because the body is never good enough. And that's why Mm. um, one of the questions of the book is, what would it take for your body to be good enough? I mean, I mentioned earlier that most of us would have a really easy answer to the question, you know, which part of your body would you like to change? You know, in our heads, we can think, oh, definitely this thing. And then I sort of say, well, imagine that you had changed that part of your body. What would you feel then? Would you feel, oh, my body is entirely perfect now. It's all finished. Nothing remains. And actually, that, that idea I think we would think of as rather arrogant and unappealing (laughs) if someone were to say everything about me is perfect you know I have no bodily imperfections we would actually think no we move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the the problem is is that as I say this sense of permanent inadequacy with the body is um, associated with really serious problems for mental health it's a public health um, uh, problem, right, at, at, on a global scale, this sense of a low self-esteem, which causes really serious suffering on a mental health level, that many of the practices we engage in to try to change our bodies are also risky at the physical level. It's not true of all of them. I spend a lot of time talking about the risks and complications of cosmetic surgery, uh, as an example. And with the bodybuilding case, I talk about um, the rise mm. of the use of steroids and the way steroids. that can be mm. very, very damaging. So I think the question is, yeah, having an ideal, that's great. Is the ideal achievable? How do you feel if you don't make that ideal? You know, if, I've, if I'm trying to learn a new language, you know, do I feel a complete failure if I don't become fully fluent? Or do I just feel, oh, that's good, I learned a bit of a language today, you know, is it a nice feeling? Um, and what do you have to do to meet the ideal? And does that benefit you mentally and physically or not? And that's the question I think that's uh, interesting for me. Yes, I think the... the the, the role of the ideal is true in lots of parts of our life, right? I mean, I'm just thinking, I think as a survey, it finds most people think they'd be happy financially if they had 50% more. But that's true for everybody. Uh, and so the ideal of, say, a secure retirement, uh, right? Or the ideal of, you know, so financial ideals, et cetera, more, more generally. And that's good. It's baked into the definition of an ideal is that it's unattainable. Mm-hmm. Um but I wanted to ask you a, a, another question, which is like, when you think about something like health and you talk a lot about like the, the role of shame, and I think that's really an important part of your argument, that it's the sense of shame that applies to people. But I wondered a little bit about the issue of, uh, of weight, for example, and you talk a lot about fat phobia and, and fat shaming, et cetera. Um, and, and, and clearly there's a problem there. And clearly there's a problem if every, you know, everyone just hates themselves because they're five, you know, I mean, everyone's BMI is a bit too high or whatever. But I also do worry a little bit about the opposite problem, which is that we're kind of just unwilling to recognize that, you know, there is a problem, a health problem associated with a certain level of weight, which can lead to other health problems. And what makes it really stark is that some of those health problems lead to modifications. So uh, if you, like a lot of people, people with chronic diabetes, for example, very often end up having to have a limb amputated, usually a foot. And there are some parts of the US, very poor parts of the US, where I, you know, back of the envelope calculations lead me to think there are almost as many amputees as there were coming back from Vietnam. And so what you're happening there is like, because like, it is actually unhealthy to be at a certain weight. And that's a very different problem to the problem of striving for this perfect, you know, Adonis ideal or Athena ideal. So how do you think about the role of a social norm that could be more positive, which is like, it, it is better everything else equal to try and keep your weight, you know, within reasonable bounds, uh, which I think most of us would agree it is. What's the, is there a positive role for a social norm there? Great. So I think well, the question of what is helpful, that's an empirical question, right? And what's really important is that we look at the, the empirical findings on some of these questions. Now, this isn't something that I'm personally expert on, but I've, you know, I've um, read and engaged with the work of those, those who are. 
One of the key findings seems to be that shaming people for their bodies, shaming people for their weight, for their fatness, is not an effective public health measure, right? That's not something that actually works. If what you want is people to lose weight, then shaming them for feeling fat does not work. It's not, it's not effective. So even if you don't care about the kind of ethical aspects of that, it's not an effective public health measure. I mean, so much um, that explains questions of obesity and ill health is not about what individuals choose to do. It's about the context in which people are living. It's about the impact of, of poverty. It's about the, the foods which are cheap and available, the foods they can buy within um, walking distance or traveling distance from their home. It's about um, these kind of broader social questions. And so placing the emphasis on individuals should choose to do things that make them not obese it's just simply often failing to get the right place so i think that the shame aspect of the kind of fat shaming is just not doing the right work i mean one um book that i read when reading this when thinking about this work and that i found really um insightful is the book by um, sophie hagan who is a a fat activist but also a stand-up comic Mm. right and she writes Mm. in her book this very simple thing she says most of us have been taught to hate fatness from a very young age, right? It's a pretty simple observation, but it's really true that there is a very strong sense of fatness as being associated with all kinds of negative character traits, whether it's greediness or laziness Mm. or being disgusting or or, or gross, I think is another word that she uses for it. And she details how she, as as a fat person, was subject to that pressure throughout her childhood and adulthood was placed on a huge number of diets and constantly battling with her weight. And none of that actually succeeds in making her thinner because that's not what, you know, the causes of fatness and obesity at both the individual and the social level are much more complicated than that. So we need public health policy that works. We need it to be evidence-based rather than based on some, you know, assumption that if we just tell people to eat healthily, that will work. That may well work for people with a certain level of of wealth and privilege who are able to have to exercise really you know quite expansive choice choice over what they eat what they buy because they have the the financial and other means to to do that but for many people that's simply not the situation they're growing up with and oftentimes public health measures that aim to reduce obesity for health reasons at the general population level um, either are not successful or perhaps even sometimes um, get things uh, make things worse so um, a one piece of evidence that was given to the UK Parliament um, Women and Equality Select Committee from a, a scientist working on this, Francesca Solmi, said that actually if you look at many public health measures that look like they might help, for example, the um, a move to pl- put calorie counting information on, on the menus in restaurants, right? That's, that's a, an example of a public health yeah. measure that's attempting to reduce obesity. But she said there's actually not evidence that that works on a global on a population level um doesn't necessarily make people choose healthier options or choose because if all the things in the restaurant are unhealthy if every dish is over a thousand calories as they were in one restaurant i went to in the states um before the pandemic which i won't name you know if every option is an unhealthy option what do you do you either leave or you eat the unhealthy option but what you do is you feel bad you feel bad about what you've eaten you feel bad about yourself and in fact there's some evidence that suggests that having that kind of information on restaurant menus actually may just lead to increases in disordered eating, right? So it's not actually helping public health. So we need to know what actually works from a public health perspective. And it seems to me like shaming people for being fat is pretty much been shown not to, not to be successful. Yes, I think that's right empirically. I think it's true around alcohol campaigns too, actually. I did a bit of work on that. Um, and I think the the evidence that you show about shaming is absolutely right. Um, and I think that it comes back to this sense of like feeling okay in your body, that actually the idea of hating your body for whatever reason is just turns out to be bad ethically and empirically. You know, if you hate your, like, I don't know, another example for adolescent boys to hate their uh, wet dreams, you know, mm. uh, or their sex drive or adolescent girls to hate menstruation or people who are overweight to hate their bodies. None of that seems to be, you know, uh, positive, uh, at all. And I think it's partly because of you, you, what you just, I think you make this point very strongly. You made it again now, which is it's about this idea of responsibility. 
It's like, who's responsible? And I think that if it's the individual's responsibility, it tells me something about you as an individual. I think that's what's wrong with the debate about obesity, by the way, which is that actually, if it's seen as an individual issue, then that's a very different ethical uh, conclusion than what I would see, which is some of what you've already mentioned, but an incredibly broken and predatory food system. I mean, the food system literally makes people sick, makes them fat, makes them sick, and then we blame them for it, right? We don't blame big ag, we don't blame big food, we don't, right? And so we have a system, a structure that leads people to be overweight, which is bad, right? It's bad to be significantly overweight, healthy, right? but it's not the person who's bad, it's the system that's bad. And I think that the problem is that we don't, our fear of, our fear of wanting, our fear that we're going to make this, it seem like the individual is bad, prevents us from saying that that, that that level of overweight is bad, just objectively bad. Um, uh, and so there's a, there's a difficult balance to strike here um, because I think some of the kind of fat positive movement and so on, it actually strives to claim that there is nothing wrong with being very overweight. So I, I expect right? that the messages that we you know, receive and are aware of will going to differ, obviously, obviously, depending on, on you know, our, our context, our place, and, and so on. I, th- I would expect, I'm not wishing to speak on behalf of people who are, are fat or overweight, but I would expect that many people who are fat or overweight would say the problem is not that no one ever told them it was bad to be fat. Right? They would say that they get that message very clearly all the time. Um, and there's a quote at the very end of, of Intact of my book from um, Stephanie Yeboah, who's a fat positive um, writer. And she says it's something like, you know, we're not saying that, it's, that you, it's, it's OK to be fat or something or you should love yourself being fat. I can't remember the exact quote. She's just saying you don't have to hate yourself because you are fat. You know, we're not encouraging you to be fat, but you don't have to hate yourself. So it's that that idea. Um, one of the things I just thought when you were speaking as well is the, the flip side of this question about whether we should highlight you know fatness or not is also about exercise right and so often we talk about exercise as being something we should do as a sort of punishment or a penance right I have to go and exercise because I ate a chocolate bar or whatever it might be and again I've seen on some of these sort of body positivity um social media feed the message you know exercise for joy not for punishment right and again if we could get to an idea of of sort of joy in our bodies because it feels much more like something we'd want to do right if we move our bodies for the joy of it than because we have to atone for a piece of cake or something like that yeah somebody i can't remember who was wrote that if you treat exercise as a giving a gift to your body right that completely changes how you think about it i think it's really not and i try when i go for a run i try to think i'm giving a gift to my body i'm not i'm not paying penance for it i want to dig in a little bit to the mind body uh, uh question that you spend quite a bit of time on and you're quite uh, worried about the idea of, and this is particularly from the trans uh, movement, the idea of I'm just in the wrong body. Uh, I've got, you know, so there's a, there's a mind body disconnect here. Uh, and so let's fix the body, right? <laughs> and you make the point very well that sometimes we think actually it's the mind that's wrong and you use anorexia as a very good example of that. When someone says, you know, I'm, I'm not skinny, I'm, I'm too fat, even when they're dangerously underway, you tend to assume there's something wrong in their mind and how they're looking at themselves. But but it's the opposite when we think about mind in the bo- in mind you know trapped in the wrong body, mm. uh, and I think you're worried about that because it actually solidifies a gender binary in some ways. Um, it's quite normative in some ways, but also I think for a deeper reason because I think that idea of being in the wrong wrong body is a univer- You say it's a universal experience, uh, and by making it a special experience, there's a danger that we actually play into the very problem you're identifying here, which is wrong body, right? We're all in the wrong body one way or another. Uh, have, I, have I characterized your position correctly? And can you say a bit more about why that framing of, of the issue concerns you? Yeah, sure. So in one of the later chapters of Intact, I talk about, a cha- I have a chapter which is called Choosing to Modify. And I think they're about the various reasons people might have very consciously to choose to modify their bodies. And I talk about the approaches that say that the body should be something we modify as a form of creativity, right, with the use of things like tattoos and piercings and so on. Um, uh, I talk about the idea of body modification as self-care. And then I look at some of the discourses that I find by listening and reading, engaging with various trans voices. So um, I spent quite a lot of time reading the work of many trans theorists and trans activists who describe and theorise about that trans experience. And what I found in engaging with that work is two different kinds of ways of framing body modification for gender identity. 
And on one framing, um, some trans people or gender non-conforming people think of body modification for gender identity as being a form of kind of creativity, as a form of choice. They think of it in terms that are analogous to other forms of cosmetic procedure. So Jack Halberstam would be a clear example of that kind of theorist who talks about you know, this being a choice that the person might do to inhabit their, their body in a way that they, will, they want to do. But there's a significant number of trans people who talk about this idea of uh, modification as being deeper than that, as being something that is a necessary um, response to this idea of, as you say, being in the wrong body. Now, many trans people have rejected that particular phrase. So there's a question about that particular phrase, being in the wrong body. So um, the, the feeling that modification is a necessary response to dysphoria, that it can alleviate dysphoria, that's still very prevalent for many trans people, though, though by no means all. But the idea of being in the wrong body is something that there's disagreement about within the trans community and whether that's an accurate reflection. So some trans people think of it as being... Um, a formulation that they have had to develop and inhabit so as to access um, healthcare, right? That with um, gender uh, gender, uh, uh, modification being medicalised and being gatekept, then having to present with a very specific form of dysphoria that fits with a particular medicalised model has been necessary. And so being born in the wrong body has been a way of expressing that. Um, But as I say, even among those trans people who reject that phrasing, there are still lots of people who do talk about it as being a response to a a feeling of wrongness, a feeling of dysphoria, a feeling of of incompatibility between the body and and the identity. And really, my, my role in this part of the book is not to cast judgment on which way of understanding one's relationship to one's body is is correct, but really to try to analyze the sort of commonalities and differences between different practices in different places we find that that narrative so i do think it's the case that the idea that our bodies should correspond in some way to our identities is a really strong ideal in contemporary societies something that philosopher Cressida hayes talks about really um, compellingly in work that i cite in intact right we have this strong idea that the body should reflect the Mm. identity and that's part what, of what does the work mm-hmm. that we talked about earlier, where we think about um, whether you know, you're letting yourself go, whether you're showing yourself at your best. So your body work reflects your, your virtue as a, as a person. There's that connection there. It's not so the real me. It's not the real me in some way, is it? Yeah. It's not the real me. Getting your body back, right? I've got to make my body align with who I am. This is a feature we see in all kinds of different practices. And it's also not in any sense only for, for trans people that we think that the right solution to a feeling of disconnect between body and identity is to change the body. Again, we have that message um, repeated in many, many other contexts. So what I want to say about that is not that that makes trans people's um, feelings of dysphoria any less significant. It's not to say that it's just the same as these other feelings of, of disconnect and discontent. But just to say, in a way, the opposite, to say, look, we can see this as part of a broad social pattern that we are very, you know, collectively very keen on the idea that our bodies can and should be changed to fit who we are and that they are wrong if they don't. And that it's just worth reflecting on that and thinking about how we can, without saying that people shouldn't do particular practices of modification, how we can create a culture that doesn't tell them that they have to do that. That's really what I'm trying to do. Get away from the shame and the pressure to modify, not get away from any particular practices of of modification. Um, It's not my aim to pass judgment on particular choices people make because we all choose for the best, you know, as best we can within the context we we have. Yes, uh, I think that's very well said. Um, And you say it very well in in the book too. Uh, And I also think there's another aspect to this, which is, I understand the reasons for it. I think you've said it well, too. It reminds me a little bit of the debate about the gay gene, right? It's like mm-hmm. if we could find some sort of natural scientific explanation, then we're good. And we never found it. But it, 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 it it's sort of playing by the existing rules in a way. And you can see why, from an advocacy point of view, that might be useful, as you say. But, but that in the long run, I have the same worry that you do, that it not only contributes to the sense of, like, wrong bodiness, <laughs> um, but also it takes away a little bit of fluidity. Uh, it does make come back to this binary, 
and the sense of like, which is it, <laughs> you know? And so you lose the sense of like, um, there are some people that like live as a woman during the week and a man at the weekend. There was a famous world war two spy whose name I can't remember now who dressed as a woman at the weekends, uh, in Spain. Um, and it was well known to the good. No one really cared as long as the intelligence kept coming. And, and so that sense of kind of being able to move around a little bit and also just being um, somewhat ambiguous, and, and the, the distribution is overlapping, basically, creating more space for kind of movement, both within a life, but also kind of between it. It sort of feels like it's become quite binary again in, in the current trans debate uh, in some ways. Is that, am, I being, yeah. am I being unfair? I think you can find that. I think it would be wrong to imply that, um, that, 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 that trans people support a binary. There is a great deal of really you know, sophisticated and important trans theories, particularly trans philosophy, the, the, the area I know the best, you know, which absolutely tackles head on these, these complexities and these questions of how to locate one's experience and how to situate that within a broader kind of theoretical framework. I think you do see a lot of good work on that. I have a quote in the book mm. um, from Pat Califia about this precise question of trying to introspect about one's own reasons for having an attitude to one's body and finding, you know, not, not being able to give a definitive answer. Do we ever know ultimately why we feel as we feel, why we do as we do? Perhaps, perhaps we don't. Um, and also your reference to the gay gene argument, I think, also brings into play this really important um, feature, which is that there is always a, a sort of political um, question always at stake with these questions, which is what is best going to serve um, a community best in terms of equality and, and respect and so on. So, you know, there's uh, empirical social science evidence that shows that people are more likely to um, respect and support equal rights for gay and lesbian people if they also believe that being gay or lesbian is not a choice, right? So there's, there's a sense in which it makes a difference what empirical story you tell about yourself to, to the rights you will be given, right? And again, in the writings of, of trans people you find that clearly this kind of rage that they are often having to express their narrative in a certain way so as to receive respect or so as to receive medical treatment and what we really ought to be doing is we ought to be moving towards a situation where people are able to express the ambiguity in their experience people are able to express doubt and disagreements people are able to have debates about questions that are unclear and for that ambiguity disagreement and doubt not to be uh, you know, dangerous socially, and that sh that should be something we ought to be able to do much more openly. And I hope, I hope we will soon be able to do that. At the moment, that is not an easy situation for for most people. I agree. I think this idea of ambiguity is something that's quite important. Actually, there's there's a certain value to ambiguity that we don't we don't want to lose. Um, uh, and I fear that we could we could could lose in some ways. Like life is ambiguous in, in many ways. One of the things that I, I just wanted to talk to you a bit about in the remaining uh, few minutes that we have is that the decision who makes decisions uh, particularly about modifications and when and you you go through very well through the various theories that could guide you know how these decisions are made reversibility and so on and and particularly this idea of open futures and that actually the best you know, a good guide is to leave as many as many possible futures open to you as possible and so on and I like all that. And I'd like you to talk a bit more about that. But one question you don't answer, and you specifically don't answer it, which was interesting given your work on the Council of Bioethics and the work you've done here, is age. Is there a certain age at which we think people can start to make decisions about modifying their body? And you very specifically say, I'm not going to answer that question. And that was an interesting decision for me because it feels like that's a pretty important question in the current debate. Can you say a bit more about why you didn't come down on that one? Sure, yeah. I mean, there's an enormous... Um literature, uh, philosophical and legal literature and case law about this precise question. And the dominant way of thinking about this, um, at least in, in sort of UK case law, is this, this idea of, of Gillick competence, right, which is an idea that says that the question of when a child is capable of giving autonomous consent to a procedure depends on factors about the child and factors about the procedure, right? So Partly, it clearly depends on the child's particular um, maturity and mental capacity. And children, you know, mature and develop an ability to understand these complex things at different rates. Um, but there's also a, a, relevant, a relativity to what the procedure is. So the ability to understand the concept of what will happen if you have your ears pierced 
right? The implications, the costs, the risks, and so on. It, that's something that a child can probably do at a much earlier age than understand the complexities of, you know, some much more complicated procedure. So that's something that is sort of very well established. There's that complexity. Um, and it's partly because I think there's a really sort of well-established literature on that. I think that it's right to think that lots of these decisions are going to be relative to the particular procedures and relative to particular patients. Um, so what my question that I wanted to think about was, OK, so we, we know for sure there are some procedures for which a child, a given child, does have autonomous ability to consent to and others for which the child does not. Right? That, that's a, that's a, a clear thing. What should we do in those cases where children are not capable of making autonomous decisions about the bodies? That's really the, the, the key question. And in the ethical literature on that question, there are lots of different proposed principles right, that come into play, ideas like we should do what's in the child's best interests or we should prioritise the question of reversibility or we should focus on autonomy, lots of questions like that. Mm. And lots of these principles, I think, can do a good job of explaining what to do in sort of the easy cases, but they don't tend to do a very good job in the hard cases, right? And there are lots of really, really hard cases. Um, and in the book I list nine different examples of hard cases um, and show how some of the existing frameworks just don't deal with them. Some of these cases are hard because they deal with people who will never become autonomous. They have uh, some form of disability or impairment that means that they're never going to be autonomous, so we can't say what's going to happen to them. Some of these cases are difficult because the question of what to do is, is irreversible either way. Um, so a couple of examples I use here are, um, are cochlear implants and puberty blockers for children. So these, kind of pr these pro um, procedures are irreversible either way. So if you think about cochlear implants, if a child is going to have the best outcome from a cochlear implant, um, they need to have them at about the age of two, um, but doing that will uh, destroy residual hearing. So you've got an irreversible option either way. Either you do the implant at a very early age and destroy the residual hearing and you can't reverse that, or you don't do the implant at an early age and then you lose that window for helping the child to develop high levels of um, spoken language proficiency. So there's an irreversibility either way in those cases. And in many of these cases, this is really crucial, I think, the question of what's in the child's best interests is precisely the question that is disputed. And so saying that we ought to do whatever is in the child's best interest just is completely unhelpful. So that principle, you know, there are some cases where that principle works, where it's clear what is in a child's best interests, and we all agree and we have to do this procedure now and so we should authorise it. But it's not those easy cases that we need help with, you know, at the philosophical level. We need help with the, with the complicated cases. And in those complicated cases, very often the question is precisely what is in a child's best interests. So you can't rely on that as a, as a standard. Mm. So what I argue is, to sort of give it in a... To sum it up, you know, if there is a procedure which could wait until the child can give autonomous consent, nothing is lost by waiting, then we should generally wait mm. until the child can give their autonomous consent. Most cosmetic procedures are like that. Um, if a procedure... Um, cannot be delayed until the child can make a properly autonomous choice and it's clearly in the child's best interests then we should proceed but if it's not clear that it's in the child's best interests if there's really you know significant doubt whether it's because the procedure itself is not adequately um evidence-based and we just don't know or whether it's because we we cannot predict what a child's own preferences will be in future um then i argue that we should uh respect bodily integrity, children's bodily integrity by not doing the procedure. We should err on the side of caution, in other words. Um, and so I give arguments for why it's better to err on that side of caution. Um, that's the side of... It's better to do wrong by not intervening than to do wrong by intervening when there's sort of significant yes. doubt. Yeah. You should, tilt, you should tilt that way. And I think the example of intersex is a very good... Uh, you use that very well too, which is to just, just, just wait um, non-intervention as far as, as possible. Well, I just... Um, I want to give you just... If you have a couple more minutes to talk a little bit about uh, male circumcision because it's mm. such a striking part of the book. And I'm very interested in this anyway because I've raised kids on both sides of the Atlantic and I've got three boys. 
Uh, so it's been really interesting to discover. I mean, I think you quote the figures that 80% of American boys are still circumcised, 6% in the UK. And it's just the norm. And it absolutely is the norm um, in the US in a way that just isn't in the UK. And you spend quite a bit of time on this um, and how it's an example of what's really cultural. I mean, it's dressed up as medical. But you, I mean, I think you take the American Pediatric Association pretty well to task uh, here for the way that they structure it. And it's just very weird. I mean, did you know all that before? Uh, why did you spend so much time on that issue? I mean, I think it is fascinating and it doesn't get much attention by contrast to, you know, looking at female genital mutilation. Um, it doesn't get, and it's a great example of what we're just talking about. It's like, it's going to affect your future. It's an erogenous, the foreskin has some function. It's an erogenous thing. And it just gets cut off four out of five American boys with not much thought going, going into it. Can you say a bit more about the work that that example does for you in, in the general context of your argument about open futures, autonomy, and bodily integrity, etc., uh, uh, and, and why, I guess, why you spent so much time on it? Great. Well, I'll give you a kind of autobiographical explanation and a philosophical one, if you like, so to get it two ways round. So this was an example that I used in my, in my first book just because I thought it was an interesting example so that was a time when there was a lot of feminist work criticizing um, what is called often female genital mutilation or female genital cutting and there was a kind of general consensus within feminist and liberal theory that this was a bad practice that should be prevented Um, but there was no genuine debate at all about the practice of male circumcision and I was just interested in thinking about about why that might be so I had a a little discussion of it in, in my first book um And as a result of that, I think I was invited to address a conference which was um, organised by an organisation that particularly campaigns against um, medically unnecessary genital cutting on both um, boys, girls and intersex children. So it's a kind of campaigning organisation for Mm. all of those things. And at that conference, I met for the first time, really, because in the UK this is not a, um, a common movement because circumcision is so... Uh, uncommon here you know a large number of men who had had circumcisions and who had felt deeply traumatized by that whether it was because they had had some medical complication uh, with their circumcision or whether it's because they had just felt a deep sense of of loss and so that really took me into thinking about that issue some more and listening to and learning from that work and just seeing that it is a really profoundly um, significant issue for many men on the contrast, many other men who have been circumcised report no such feelings. They report no feelings of, of loss. They report complete happiness with having been circumcised, even gratitude for having been circumcised, right? So this is interesting. And, of course, you can understand why men feel a sense of loss if they've had a clinical mm. complication and they've suffered physically. But what, why would there be this difference in terms of a, a, a mental response that's not about a physical, a physical harm to them? So... That's the kind of autobiographical reason. And then the philosophical reason. So then if you think about what this is, as you say, in the book I talk a lot about the different ways that circumcision is addressed in the UK National Health Service patient-facing literature and the American Academy of Pediatrics patient-facing literature. And what's really important in that example for me is, of course, we know that circumcision is a, is a cultural practice we can see that just by the fact that it's practiced at different levels in different cultures but it, it's deeper than that it's that whether it even counts as medical is a cultural question so what you do see right. in the american academy of pediatrics site but not at all in the national health service site is a debate about the health benefits and health risks of, of circumcision so in the uk nhs site you simply see the the, the statement that Circumcision is, as they call it, a treatment of last resort for a limited number of complications, and that Mm. in most cases it's not necessary, um, and it talks about what else you might do. And it makes a reference to the fact that circumcision might be practiced for religious or cultural reasons, but but it's a very um, passing reference because, of course, the NHS is a health organisation, not a cultural or religious organisation. Um, On the American Academy of Pediatrics site, you get a completely different picture. You get, on the one hand, the fact that the AAP does not recommend routine circumcision. It says that the evidence is not strong enough for recommending it. But it also says the benefits outweigh the costs. And it runs through the various benefits and costs very much within a health-related context. So it talks about the way that circumcision has various um, 
um, preventative health benefits, according to their analysis. Um, but they also include in that supposedly clinical analysis various um, benefits which are clearly cultural. So they talk about things like um, that uh, having a circumcised penis will often be regarded as being more attractive. So that's, that's a cultural benefit, but they're placing it in in a kind of clinical assessment. Um, and I talk about lots of other examples of this the debate here. So philosophically, what that's doing for me is it's showing that the question of whether something is even considered as clinical it is cultural. And the question of whether cultural quest, um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, implications count in the pros and cons is, comes in there with that clinical setting. Um, so, so yeah, <laughs> sorry, that was a long answer, but that's some of the reason we could, I could say more mm, about fascinating. that. Fascinating. Like. No, I, I, I'm fas- fascinated by it. And also, I think it's a great note to end because it does, it brings together so many of your themes and how what's normal becomes what's normative uh, and that can become quite restrictive and how the difference between culture and by, you know, how in the end, the cultural constructs around some of these things are just so powerful um, that you, they, you don't even see them. Right? The, you know, a really powerful culture is one way that you don't see. Uh, and I think this is a great, a great example of that, as well as a very specific and, and I think under, understudied issue. But I think, it's, I think it just, it's a good example of your overall approach. And I'll, I'll finish by saying kind of where I started, which is just as, a, as an even-handed, thoughtful overview of some of these really kind of very difficult and now quite political issues, I think, I think your book Intact really is just, it stands alone uh, among the work I've seen so far. Uh, you just get the sense of you're, you're, you're writing in good faith, you're thinking out loud, you're saying it's difficult, you're saying what you don't know, you're saying, here's what I do know. And I, so I just think as a, a, as, a, as a way of working, it's also exemplary as well as in its content. So thank you for your work and thanks for coming on today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate those, those kind words. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.